Um, we're going to talk a little bit about conflict, or I guess we're going to talk all about conflict. We're going to bring um, a few real scenarios in, and we will ask for some audience participation. Um, I've got at least one person in the room that will recognize some of these stories, perhaps, um, from people he may know. Um, uh, I know it's, uh, Sam Luber was in my department um, for quite a while, or still is in the department now. Okay. It's coming. It's coming. And here we come. Aha. Okay. Excellent. Need the clicker. All right. Good. So I'll take the first roll. Okay. Sure. And so, uh, no disclosures for either of us relevant to this. None of us are pushing a book or anything else. Um, none of us. No. At least I don't have a book. You don't have a book. No. What? No book. No book. No book to pedal. No. Oh no! Not yeah. yet. Not, not yet. yet. Soon to be coming. Yes. Um. So conflict, and when you say conflict, most people go straight to war and to fighting, right? That's what we think about. That's the word, you know, disagreement is often what it is uh, when people are talking about something a little gentler. Um, but when we talk about conflict at work, especially things that generate some emotions, we usually go right to the fight. But I think it's worth pausing for a little bit just about the definition of the word conflict. So as a noun, it is a violent disagreement. You're at war with someone but it doesn't have to be, right? When used as the verb, it is just two things that are in conflict. There's no emotion attached to it, but one is not going to allow the other to happen. Um, it's obstruction, two cars coming the same direction down a one-way or opposite directions down a one-way road. They're in conflict with what's going to happen. You need to figure out how to do that. But the reason it's worth at least reflecting on that is because if you can figure out how to manage the other parts of the conversation, the emotion that creeps in, the way you're reacting in, in the scenario, you'll be better able to get yourself out of it and in a peaceful resolution. So there are gazillion books on conflict management and everything from the art of war um, to you know, changing the conversation, negotiating the impossible. I've left one on top, though, that I found personally very um, uh, Meaningful is the wrong word, I guess, but it's, it's resonated with me. Um, and it's by Daniel Shapiro. He is a negotiator at the Kennedy School of Government. This is a guy who does real world negotiations. Um, but it's not about how to win an argument. It's not about how to outposition or outflank your opponent. It is about understanding what the root of the conflict is and how to navigate through it. So he has stories about married couples. He has stories about um, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He's got stuff from the Balkans. He's from all over the place, but he brings it all in in a, in a way that resonates with me. And we're going to touch on a couple of the points from his book as we move through these. And of course, the problem with books, right? So you can read the theory in book, and you take it out to the real world, and everybody gets thumped. Um, so read at your own risk or incorporate at your own risk. And to uh, dovetail on the last presentation, and I'm embarrassed if it was already mentioned, but uh, there's a, um, a website called Blinkist, B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, that summarizes all those books in like 15 minutes or less. And uh, are, it's very handy. You can either listen to it or read it, and uh, that way you don't have to commit to actually reading through all those books. I've bought a lot of them, read some and continue to buy a lot of them. So Blinkist, I find, is very helpful. And I have nothing to do with Blinkist. I'm just a subscriber. So, um, so one of the things we think, gosh, so much of what we do in negotiation are really what we learned in kindergarten. And somehow that changes. Because in kindergarten, we have some basic rules, right? We have share your cookies and share the toys and don't kick your buddy next to the sleeping mat and try to overall get along. And when fights break out, it's actually a bad thing. And then what actually happens is negotiation as we grow older and get in positions and have titles and work uh, professionally after all our training is it's more like what I learned at National Geographic, kind of like those um, the wolves there, right? You can like cue up the music and the cheetah's coming and you're the baby gazelle and something's going to happen and you're going to lose something like maybe your life and it's all different. And in reality, with this book, Negotiating the Non-Negotiable, it kind of takes a step back from what all that is and actually focuses on the people who are involved. So emergency medicine, we have lots of sources of conflict. If you think about it, when what we do is amazing and amazing for patients, but we negotiate with patients, in some ways we negotiate with our staff, 
and we certainly negotiate with co consultants and admitting services. In general, people see us as people who give other people work. And that's a tough position to be in. We're already on a weird side of the negotiation table almost every time we go to work. So some of that could be clinical, some of that could be business, some of that could be academic, and all those things together obviously take a big impact on your personal negotiations in your life because the things you learn and the tools you use in your workplace actually transcend to your personal existence. So at the 10 and 2 position, money and time. Money and time matters to everyone, and those are the two things that matter to all faculty and things that matter to residents. Now that could be buffered by some other things that influence those. Behavior is one of them, and we're going to go through several episodes of different behavioral things that will be familiar to all of you. Performance, RVUs, resident evals, all the things we ask our faculty and residents to do get somehow reflected and cause some areas of conflict. And then lastly, emergency medicine is huge in terms of turf. We took turf as part of our history away from other people. So in some ways, our legacy to people who still are alive and walking around and know a world before emergency medicine existed, see us as those humans. Fortunately, most of them are moving on. I don't want to say they died, that's so sad. But nonetheless, they're moving on outside of their, outside of the careers. And most people understand emergency medicine at this point. But think about what we are as a specialty and how that's a huge conflict. So what does resolution look like? And I think the, one of the challenges, if you're just fixated on the first definition of conflict, it looks like a conqueror, right? If you got through the conflict, you've won. Um, and we're going to walk through a couple ways where you can get through conflicts where there's not a winner, but where everyone feels like they've gotten something out of it. And some of that comes from back in the approaching, you know, to Andre's point on we always call with bad news, right? None of us ever page a service in the middle of the night and say, hey, good news, I've got this patient with abdominal pain, I'm going to send him home. You don't need to come see him. Um, <laughs> and so 100 years ago when I was an intern, one of the faculty members um, at University of Chicago came in at 11 o'clock at night and he sent myself and the second year resident out to his car that was in the ambulance bay and it was full of ice cream and all the stuff to make ice cream sundaes and he brought it all inside and we've set it up in the nurse's lounge and he said, what are we doing? He says, go page every resident who's on call tonight in the hospital. And like, well, why are we doing that? He says, because it shouldn't always be bad news when the ER calls. And he only did that once a year, but I promise you, every resident knew when he was on, who he was, and they'd heard the legends of the ice cream sundaes, right? Because sometimes you called back if he was working, because maybe it was ice cream, right? Not the real part. <laughs> so we're going to get into this. One of the challenges in emergency medicine that we face, and then the house of medicine, is the tribes effect, where we have assumed the team colors of emergency medicine, and anyone who threatens the team threatens us somehow. And for those of us, um, not myself, but there are folks in our specialty who are dual boarded, right? So they will sometimes switch teams and they'll go put a different jersey on when they go up and they work in the ICU or when they um, go off and do something, whether it's internal medicine, if they're dual boarded that way, or peds, go off and do the other things. And the jerseys will switch. And one of the things that Shapiro will tell you is that our definition of teams is really arbitrary and just based on our experience. We went, for those of you, we went to emergency medicine, went into training, decided to be an emergency medicine resident, graduated from the program, and now we're an ER doctor, and that's great, and we've got the team, we're wearing it, maybe we're tattooed, right? We've fully bought on to this, but it's an artificial construct of our job, and if we let the war of what that's about, we sometimes won't allow intelligent conversations to hap that allow, allow, happen that allow room for compromise when you're dealing with complex scenarios and situations. And we'll go through some of them. And some of you have faced these fights. But if you're locked in just the team and can't step back out and be a human about it, your negotiations stop right at the beginning because obviously we want emergency medicine to win, so they have to lose. So when you're thinking about, just another moment on the tribe's effect, the experiment that uh, the author did for this was he actually took groups of roughly random people who were going to one of his talks, um, 45, 50-ish folks, and, and, brought, and separated them into groups somewhere between 6 and 10. 
and gave them controversial topics to talk about amongst themselves. It could be random, it could be politics, it could be um, any number of things. These are non-medical folks. And then, not for that long, 15 or 20 minutes. And at the end, um, and they declared them each a tribe. And at the end, the notion was, okay, all of you have to decide which tribe wins um, and which tribe is able to lead um, the, all the rest of the tribes, otherwise the world's going to blow up. It was a ridiculous scenario, but out of over a hundred times that he did this, the world was only saved five times. People in a very short period of time can develop this tribe mentality over maybe one specific issue, and it's hard for them to think of themselves as have, being members of a team on another, in, in another institution or um, another service. So it can happen extremely quickly, and particularly for emergency medicine, we've been at this roughly 50 years or so. Um, it's, there's a lot already there. So, and I'll take it to one other spot. How many of you are in a city with more than one training program in emergency medicine? Most of the room. How many of you view yourself in competition with that other program for students or for faculty? How? The hands go up a little slower. A little slower, a little slower. And, and for the hands to go up a little slower is maybe it a little more, maybe it's a different C word, maybe it's borderlining on conflict because you actually like when you win, right? You relish in the one that you got when you recruited. I work in a hospital system now that has, we have 12 acute care hospitals and we say we're a system, but we're really a loose federation of states. And we're in intense conflict with each other to steal doctors, nurses, patients, volume, and we're looking for the win. Um, so even if you think you're on the same team, you can be on in different tribes within the team. Um, so emotions. Um, the uh, Asshole Survival Guide is a pretty good look on this about how to deal with folks that are really unpleasant to work with if you're looking for something interesting. The simple thing about emotions, and what Shapiro will point out, is you, you cannot tell people don't to have them, right? This, for those of you who have children, if you tell someone to calm down when they're getting excited, it, it does not work well for my 15-year-old daughter. Um, it doesn't work well for my younger daughter. I know much better than to try it on my wife. But when people are getting animated, they're animated because it's, they're feeling it viscerally, right? If someone, if someone says something that offends you in a meeting or in a talk, you get a little flushed, you might sweat a little bit, you feel your pulse go up, your blood pressure is probably a little higher. This is a physical thing that's happening to you, recognizing it's what critical to be able to move around it, especially because it's going to take you off your game if you're trying to negotiate something complicated. So you can't tell someone not to have them. You've got to deal with them directly, be aware of them, be cognizant of them. And you want to address the concern. And one of the most important things is to recognize when you're doing this to someone else. When you're in a room trying to figure out how we're going to work through a conflict, maybe you think it's a disagreement, hasn't gotten to conflict yet, you're trying to negotiate someone with someone else and they're getting animated, understanding how you can de-escalate them, understanding what you've done that has set them off, instead of just saying they're getting emotional about it and they're reacting to it, your the way that meeting goes for you will be much better if you can get them to calm down, not by giving in, but by understanding what trigger you did, what you've said that has set them off. And it doesn't mean that it didn't need to be said, but you've got to work them through that process before you can move on, or the conversation is not likely to go very far. Um, one other one, beyond reason, um, is Shapiro and a partner of his um, did one specifically all about emotions. And again, We've got a bookshelf full of these things, but some of them are worth looking at. Um, the Tribal Mind, this talks a little bit about some of the different ways you can get pulled into it, and maybe just so we can get to some of the scenarios, I won't belabor those, okay. and we'll go straight to the next. Okay, great. Okay, vertigo. So vertigo is one of these things described in this, um, in this book talking about when your brain just kind of goes out of control once you've been assaulted by some comment or something. Um, uh, Jamie talked about emotions there. I mean, we've been all trained to kind of try to hide those emotions and try to take information and not react because that was not, we taught, learned that in kindergarten. Um, but nonetheless, I, for instance, I can control my face but I can't control the like splotchy red stuff that appears all along my neck, so I have to like wear taller things when I know I'm going to be in a negotiation because it's a physiologic response. And it's not just physiologic, it's a mental response. So 
this is much more effective if you can think about your last few negotiations or perhaps for the sake of this discussion talk about conflicts. Just try to think of one in your head and, and the most recent one where I trapped myself into this vertigo thing was I had a really sick cardiogenic shock patient negotiating with CCU and CT surgery and then I went and saw some other patients and then the guy was getting sicker and we were talking about pressors and all these things were happening and then I noticed there's 50 people in the room and they're cannulating him for ECMO and I'm like oh my gosh and I'm struggling with guilt I should have gone in there sooner guilt that I represent my department well guilt that I wasn't with the patient's family fighting with the CT surgeon saying not fighting excuse me negotiating with the CT surgeon <laughs> saying that you know, wouldn't you rather do this in an operating room? It was like the dirtiest room in the whole, whole place. And you just get caught in it. And then the rest of the shift, I'm still thinking, like, what should I have said? What should I have done? How could I have made this better? And you go home and you're still thinking about it. What could it you know, well, how could this go better? What can we do next time? And you just can't stop. And that's what vertigo is. And you can catch yourself, and next time you think you're feeling it, is to catch yourself and try to identify those emotions and I specifically did that and realized that I almost got myself vertigo just now but just talking about it but nonetheless that's where you know you're out of control and you need to take a step back. So um, now we'll get into a couple real things and we're going to ask for a little participation. Um, for those of you who are moving into leadership positions or already are in leadership positions um, at some point you're going to be involved with the money. Um, and the money comes a couple of different ways. Um, I'm in the throes of budget season right now, so everyone is coming to me for money. They want stuff to do things with um, for physicians. We want to recruit here, this and, and sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not. Um, so this scenario, right? Rising star, they're spectacular, they're three years out of training, they're doing great stuff, on their way, loved by everyone, walk in, I'm the most productive person in your department clinically, and I deserve more money. Does that happen to anyone in the room? Oh, you're lucky. Have you been that person in the room? Yeah. <laughs> so, so how do you handle this? How do you handle when someone comes in and says, I deserve more money, right? Especially when you weren't quite prepared for it. Uh, we're going to hand you mics. Yep. years there and um, you know you could talk to them about that and if you have an incentive plan then that may be a way part of your incentive metrics that if they are productive you can give them a little more money with the incentive plan yeah so I, I think that's a great um, great uh, absolutely right if you have something that is pre-established it keeps you out of some of these conflicts so having a well-laid plan will prevent some of these conflicts um, if you look I'll tell you that everyone, I mean, so how many people think they have a compensation plan? Have a, how many people have a compensation plan they're aware of in their department? Okay. How many people think that it's fair and equitable across the board? A little less. And what if I told you that there was in emergency medicine, unless you guys have fixed it in the year I've been out of the chairs club, still has massive gender inequity for pay through emergency medicine? It's, we know from the survey data, it is absolutely there. Um, so even with plans, you can have challenges, right? Um, <clears throat> there are people who, have, who have, have fixed this and done better at it, but having a well-done plan saves you all of this. That's how I got out of it when this scenario walked into my room. I said, well, look, let's review the compensation plan. And here's the other part, is if you think, and I would suggest, are there other suggestions? Brian, you've got? I was just going to say the uh, calculus then turns from money to time. It's just the flip equation. We're going to get to that I one. That's next. So, mm -hmm. but uh, there's another. Um, I have been sometimes approached by an attending or faculty member who is looking for an increase that is actually outside of the plan. Yeah. And I find sometimes in academic and hospital healthcare institutions, the uh, notion that you can jump 15, 20 percent in a year is just simply not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Unless something distinct happens in your responsibility 
uh, the scope of your accountability, the um, areas that you're taking on that may have an especial importance in terms of the outcomes, whatever they may be for the institution, but to come in in the job capacity you're in uh, and then say, well, I'm looking for, I don't know what that would be as a percentage for that person, but it's challenging when somebody's looking for something beyond the scope of what uh, is, is, is typical in a, in a healthcare organization. And I think the private sector might be different in that regard, but uh, I have found that sometimes the only way you can have a distinctive jump, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent, is you actually have to leave and go to a new, a new position. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I think one of the challenges that I've encountered um, is the young clinical faculty who blows the doors off in their productivity when they're working and they're seeing some of their more seasoned colleagues who have significantly less ac clinical production and they're getting paid more because they're of a higher academic rank and you will get people that are chafed by that. Um, I'll tell you what I did with this person and I invited him in and said why don't you help us redo the compensation plan. You want to do something different? Let's kind of look at this a little bit differently. Um, they've ultimately gone on to do other things. but. They're, you know, and you're going to find people that are simply motivated only by maximizing their dollar and they probably won't be with you all that long. They'll continue to move on. I think there was another comment. At an academic center, there's also, also the opportunity to say, well, let's see how close you are to moving up in rank. Yeah. Um, so that's another discussion and maybe set goals and that could offset some of the disappointment that you can't go outside of the plan. Absolutely. Okay. Um, it's another one. This, I mean, they won't always come in, right? Sometimes it's going to be a little more passive-aggressive way they come in. So a faculty member comes in and, you know, you know, I read this, and it says the average salary in our region is 305,000. I think I should. What do you think about that, right? And I think, well, that's so, right? And in this sort of the same scenario, in this, and in this, what I've done, um, just to move through, because I want to talk about some other ones. My suggestion in this, if they found data, is you bury them with data. If they come in with data saying they're paid better, bring them in, bring, make them go through MGMA, make them go through the SAM salary survey, make them dig all the way through it, make them look at the clinical productivity of all these folks, and they realize, oh, well, maybe they do a lot more work than I do. Negotiation. <laughs> Um, but when I see this, I think, oh, that's someone who's interested in the finances of the department and probably does want to be buried in data or wants to make sure that um, his chair understands that the faculty are aware and interested in it. Yeah, and, and to be fair, this article was like something in the New Yorker or something. It was not anything valid <laughs> at all anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you're giving this faculty member far more credit than I would have in this case. They were in this case, they were, they were wanting, wanting a pay raise like everybody does. Um, and I, before I was chair, I wanted a pay raise, right? And it's, so it was always the, I mean, I understand the scenarios, but figuring out how to manage those folks and what's key is they're going to be, you know they're going to be disappointed when they leave your office, right? They're, I mean, I don't know, Brian, did anyone ever walk in your office and say they want more money and they walked out with more money? No, it doesn't happen that way, right? Mm -hmm. um, th those of you fortunate enough to be in that role usually be the other. You're going to bring someone in and say, guess what, we're putting you up for promotion, you're going to get a raise, or announcing to the faculty we're bumping all the assistants up by 5%. Um, so having them not leave frustrated is part of the challenge and part of how you deal with them. That's understanding where they're coming from, what their motion is, and involving them in the process so that we can move forward. What we didn't mention is asking them why or what's going on in their lives that they came about this. We always want to be data driven and we try to do everything data driven wise, but is it, does he think or he or she think that someone else got a better deal? Is there some particular life stressor involved in there? Is it, it's not just about seeing that data and maybe you can address whatever that thing is as opposed to addressing what is strictly the number. So the 10 and 2. Right, so if they can't get money out of you, they're coming for time, because that's a little squishier, right? So how many have gone to their chair's office, chief's office, and asked for time for something? I certainly did, right? Did it go real well? Sometimes? Yeah, reduction in clinical hours. And, and I'll tell you, I have a, a, a bias on this, or a pet peeve. Um, I hate the term buy-down. It's just a weird, weird term for me. It just feel it feels off, but I'm not going. 
So the bargaining scenario, right, and, and how people come in asking for time, and, and how do you handle that? Someone says they want time from you. I listen to why they think they deserve that time, and then they have to subject it to me for a long discussion of how things look from the dean perspective when I'm talking to the dean about our budget and they're worried about our clinical productivity and how the last, that's been my last several weeks is trying to help our dean understand how our numbers look so bad and how we're still a good department. So I try to take people, uh, give them a little bit larger view of what we're up against. I try to value, validate the work they're doing. Um, but then also speak to the larger mission of our department and how it fits into the bigger mission of the school and that whatever we're doing has to bring substance to the eyes of the dean or it's going to hurt our overall mission. I've, I've been on that side of that discussion, yeah. that exact discussion before. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think the, the broad set of discussions like this, when you're asking for time, what you're saying is, here's a thing that I would like to do that provides value. And if we're providing that value, we have to have some conversation about what the price of that value is. If the price of the value is zero dollars, then maybe we need to have a conversation about whether this thing needs to happen at all. Yep. So and you, you will find, um, a, I think, a nearly universal radioactive topic for academic emer emergency physicians, I believe, everywhere, is if you suggest that their non-clinical time doesn't come at the same value as their clinical time does, right? It's not well received. I made that mistake early. Um, with, and so one of the, and the, but it is a reality, right? So if someone wants to, if the dean's office wants to buy 50% of one of your faculty's time to go do something, they're gonna come and go, ooh, that's kind of a lot of money because the pediatricians are cheaper than you are. And, the reduction sometimes looks a little bit different, and the conversation has to be that it's, they want you, they're willing to pay something for it, but they would probably not support half of a neurosurgeon's clinical salary if they moved 50% of the dean's office. There'd be a reduction in that. We're a little closer to that. It's a very, very difficult topic, but the way, and I'm interested in other thoughts, one way to approach this that I've, I've always used was the, I have to make sure the whole, the rest of the department believes this is a good use of their money because I'm going to use their money to pay for this to reduce your clinical time. So this has to be something that we believe is mission critical to the department, and it's not 100%, right? Someone's gonna wish that it was some, want a different deal, but you gotta make sure that you can sell that to your whole team, otherwise you're gonna have a long line of people out the door saying they all wanna do the same thing. Yes, sir. I agree the concept of, of value per se would not be heard well, and yet, I've also had to, or find myself in some conversations where um, one has to look at that not all types of work are paid the same, mm -hmm. and that's not always fair even across the United States in all kinds of job capacities, and people could argue about whether education should be paid more, or what about people in police services, and, you know, and why there's a tremendous bandwidth in medicine from a pediatrician to a plastic surgeon. And, Strangely, some, I mean, people talk about these things, well, a dermatologist doesn't have the stress, you know, the night call, the life-threatening, and yet their, their compensation is quite high compared to some people who take on a great deal of, right. of those life-threatening things. So, you know, the, it's not really a great explanation for that, but I do ex explain to people that, um, you know, clinical work in an emergency department, you know, particularly in a high acuity setting, I mean, you're looking sometimes truly at life and death situations coming at you point blank. It's going to be compensated in a certain way than if you're, you know, writing a review article for a, a chapter in a book. It's fun. It's interesting. But it's, it, I don't think one can expect a dollar for dollar always if you change a nature of, if you change some of your job, like 20%. In fact, if you go to the dean's office, and I've had this happen mm -hmm. where somebody wants a 20% salary report, they might get 20% of their emergency medicine salary, but they might not. Right. And they have to determine for themselves overall, you know, is doing what you love, you know, uh, is it, it's not all about the dollars. And you have to kind of work that through, I think, with people. So 
to that point, at UT, the dean's office pays for the base salary. They don't pay for the specialty augmentation. So when someone says they're getting half their time paid for, it's really not half of all their time, but they're going to really want half their clinical time taken down. So this is the other side of the coin. If this hasn't happened to you, it will, right? And, and every time you get a new dean, and maybe every year when the budget comes up, if the dean didn't get it the last time. Has anyone had this conversation? Yes. So who's, who's, who's solved it? Anyone, anyone have a great resolution for it? I think we've dug ourselves a big hole by saying that we only work 28 hours a week, you know, in terms of the other effort and it is required that, you know, to, to be a functioning emergency physician. I think the focus on hours in our specialty really has done us a disservice over time uh, because it's not at all a reflection of the time or effort or the nights or the weekends or the holidays. And to actually just distill it down to an hours debate and, and nitpick about the hours endlessly is, I think, is one of the biggest mistakes we've made as a specialty. Editorial comment. So, uh, agreed. Um, and, and other comments about it? Well, I, I encountered this, at, I can say, at the University of Missouri because when I went there, we didn't really have a full-fledged, I mean, we had the structure of an academic emergency department in the medical school, but at the, when I arrived, we only had six faculty board certified in emergency medicine and about a third to a half of the staffing was per diem and locums and people working extra time. So we had to bring in a lot of faculty and establish the non-clinical aspects of the department from research to education to all of these things. And this came up when we talked about the core faculty and the 28 hours. Um, what I did was translate it into clinic time because that seemed to work. That was like a currency they seemed to understand because in pediatrics or, emer or medicine, they look in terms of a five-day week, uh, their clinic, there's 10 clinic sessions, half day, and when you look and see, well, what do people work on their clinic sessions and this type of thing, and you start to work it out that way, I could talk about a similar, uh, it, it, I had to explain the t 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the recovery time, but that concept of clinic time seemed to work for them because they, they could understand that in, in the specialties that have it. So. Another one is um, ICU time. So for a lot of academic folks, they work you know, one month, two weeks, whatever, for the year in the ICU, whatever that is, and the balance of that time is academic. And sure, there's some teaching and, and whatnot, but I found that argument uh, works well too. Yeah, I, I think, and this goes a little bit to the point, if someone comes at you or your faculty after time and money, it's going to generate angst on your standpoint, right? It's gonna generate emotional response, and your ability to step out of that emotional response and to figure out what they're coming at. Because usually if the dean's coming at you about your hours, they're mad about something, right? And they're probably mad because they can't get the budget to work. They're frustrated. They're looking for dollars from everywhere. And figuring out how you come at that in a non-emotional way. I think going where you'll lose quickly is if you lock down and say 28 hours, that's what we work, that's core faculty requirement because the smart dean's gonna come back and say, how many core faculty do you, do you really need for the number of residents that you have? Can, why are they all core faculty? Um, seems like you only need six, right? You got 18 residents, six ought to do it, so maybe you need one extra in case someone drops off, but maybe, okay, so seven, so you've got 20 faculty, so seven can work 28 hours, the rest of them, we're gonna bump them up to 36. And I know people that's happened to. Um, so you wanna figure out how you can get at it from another way, and two, to Brian's point, I think it's critical to not talk about just the clinical hours. Um, depending on, if you're talking with a surgeon, you're going to stock up, talk about call differential, weekend differentials, whatever they're paying their surgeons to take extra call on the Friday nights, on the Saturdays, through the holidays, looking and finding what the argument will not be the same in every, in every organization. So, how many patients per hour are seen in clinic versus the number of patients per hour seen in the emergency and, department? So, again, I think this is knowing your audience, right? And this is why the emotion, because if I had said that to my dean, it would have been, we pay you guys $100,000 more per year than we pay the pediatrician, so let's not talk about that, right? So, but in the right argument, that may do it. Yeah, I was just going to, I mean, one thing I wonder if, 
how other people feel about this. If over the years we've done ourselves a little bit of a disservice here by really counting our hours primarily as scheduled hours mm -hmm. and not accounting for shift differences, not accounting for transitions in care, not accounting for overlaps of shifts. We do that at the expense of really inflating then our RVUs per hour. So we're much higher than most other specialties. Right. So if you counted all those other times and made our hours reasonably close to other people's in the, ho in, in the house of medicine, it wouldn't look so different. But then our RVUs per hours would probably be less. It's just an interesting thing I think we've done over the years. And, and maybe this is it, my experience with this, sitting on one of the committees that looked at RVUs per time and comparing specialties was, I don't know if we can get away from this, the House of Medicine looking down on this or badly at this because they just don't do it. No, I, as I, long as they don't do it, I don't think they experience it and they don't have a clue. No, and, and there, as you all know, there are a whole bunch of people that think that there's a whistle that blows at 3 o'clock and everyone just walks out of the ER and the new team rolls in and then the whistle blows eight hours later and everyone drops what they're doing and moves on. You all know it's more complicated than that. You all know that your faculty spend countless hours doing other things that are essential for the functioning of the department, the functioning of the school, and figuring out a way how to build that into the narrative and get off the hours fixation is challenging, and you'll need different strategies depending on who, who it is. But we could go through the room, and I bet there are 10 different very good ideas about things that worked in their institution, but it's important to understand your audience, and critically, if you come at it emotionally and hard at it, you're gonna lose. One thing I'd like to bring up is the qualitative difference in the hours of the time that patients are getting care. If you're in the hospital and you're admitted, that inpatient doctor rounded, and then there's a lot of unsupervised time. There is no unsupervised time in the emergency department. How much of the safety margin that is created upstairs for those inpatients is coming on the work of the ED doc who was the attending physician that's the only attending physician that saw that patient between, you know, 10 a.m. when they got admitted and 9 a.m. the next day when the inpatient team rounded. Haven't heard that one before. No. Okay, keep moving a little bit. Um, nope. Oh, you get that. Yeah, I'll keep server. this. All right, excellent. Yep. A lot of good discussion. Thank you. All right, so new clinical initiative. Oh, I don't know. Maybe sepsis. Uh, faculty refuses to follow. Says I, I don't. That's not medicine. I didn't go into this to do protocolized medicine, and it's my license anyway. Um, how might you approach this person, realizing that? abiding by that protocol is important to uh, the CMO, the dean, or otherwise. Yeah, Lars. I think being as data-driven as possible and also framing it as a patient care or patient safety issue usually gets all, at least the majority of physicians on the same page if you're framing it that way as opposed to, you know, you're not you're not adopting this thing that you're supposed to, but really showing them the evidence and, and also um, working with them to, for patient care, at least. Yeah, I think it's the space. balance. Yeah, no, I think it's the balance between sort of precision medicine, which we do all the time with each patient. We get an individual plan, an individual diagnosis, and in some ways population health. And I think exactly what you're saying is that, you know, overall, uh, this can be helpful to all the patients overall, maybe not your specific patients, but the department's patients. And I also think having um, that person look into the individual cases that got protocoled or not and who shouldn't have or who should have, that's kind of in that line of if they ask a question you don't like hearing, you give them more work, but nonetheless, you know, use that, use that wisely. Anybody else? Yep, one some in the back. So in regards to physicians who seem disruptive in regards to protocols or clinical initiatives, I think many times we do have clinical initiatives that start and they just roll. And before you know it, you know, you're getting chest EKGs on every person who comes in and you're questioning, you know, why the person who got hit in the chest is getting an EKG if it was just a, you know, a minor trauma or, you know, maybe that's not the best example. but. Um, so that idea that you try to foster that energy to say, are there ways that we should modify some of these initiatives, you know, and to get that person engaged in that. But I do think those people who sometimes refuse do have some, at least the majority of them, have some value behind what they say. And the question is, is how do you harness that energy to make it productive? 
Sure, so sepsis was one of those big things and the uh, Clements University Hospital where I was before, finally one, one of the faculty members contacted pharmacy and said, okay, can we just look and see who are all the people who got vosin and vancozosin and what were their ultimate outcomes and found that a big group of them actually went home because the criteria were so strict and then we have all these people walking out there with loading doses of uh, vosin in their system. So they're looking at it in a, in a scientific way, in a data-driven way, can be very effective. Yes? I, I'm just voicing um, agreement with that. I think we are going to have an interesting next few years in our specialty as we become more protocol-driven. And this is labeled as disruptive behavior, but we work with some very smart people who recognize that this may not be right for their patients or patients as a whole, even. And so harnessing that energy and finding a way for them to find the right answer and advocating for the right answer to whoever needs to hear it is probably productive. Because it's a very compelling emotional argument, right? None of us can disagree with it out of hand. It's just how do you manage it? Yes, sir. It sounds like this person should be on that committee. Yeah, so, and it's interesting, I, I think the, um, the tone of the room, right? Most of the responses have recognized these are smart people with good stuff to say. We need to figure out how we bring them into the solution. There's another spectrum of this, though, where someone got wound up into a vertiginous spin and is just mad about something and just stomping their foot down. So I saw more of this with the CMS sepsis initiative on 30 cc's per kilo of fluid than just about anything else. People went high and right. Government can't tell me how to practice medicine even though we had compelling evidence that we were under resuscitating a whole lot of sepsis patients. And instead of, so bringing them into the conversation, like let's solve the real problem, right? They've got a goal post out here that we're not gonna hit every time because we believe it's the wrong thing to do in a subset of patients. But look, we got a lot of people we could do be doing a whole lot better on. So you bring them in, you put them on the committee and you make them part of the solution. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that if it's one faculty member, that's different than if a number, the majority or a large number, uh, have, when they express an issue, there may really be an issue, there may be something that really needs to be looked at. But if it's one faculty member who's more like an outlier, I kind of, I like to use a sports example and say, you know, as a team play, if the team has agreed to go out on the field and execute a particular play, you can't have one player all of a sudden run in the opposite direction and it isn't just my license, it's our license, it's our play. It's not one person running wherever they go on the field once you've decided to execute a play. Even a play that's not so great, well executed, often wins. Okay, one more comment in the back and then we'll go to our next case. Um, this might be hopping ahead a little bit, but um, with this case and the assistant professor who's been working hard and productive and is asking about a pay raise and the dean who's looking at 28 hours a week, it almost seems like there's, there's lack of understanding or transparency about mission, vision, values, and how the money gets spread around. But in some cases, it seems like those four things, some communication, you can resolve it. But in other cases, either there isn't a willingness to have that conversation for reasons that might be completely legitimate, um, or that's not the approach that's taken. And I feel like those situations where you can't just align everybody's mission, vision, and values and understanding of finances is where it gets really tough to resolve. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about some of those types of cases. Well, I think having a strategic plan and the MVV, Mission, Vision, and Values, is very helpful if it's done well and with everybody's input and people can really buy into it. And then that way, the, the guiding principles of that and the communication that goes around that, I think, can be very effective. Um, however, oftentimes things like this would be, if we're talking about the sepsis thing, is imposed upon us in a way that didn't exactly give emergency medicine a, a ton of opportunity for input. And I think the challenge as leaders and the challenge as chairs and leaders in your department is sometimes it's not completely up to you whether or not to, to do something that might be unfavorable. I do agree completely with the communication thing. We haven't harped on it, but this is a big point in the book that there, for every point of data, there's an emotion that's on the other side of it. And to learn why is that person so specifically against things and actually just hearing them out, um, I think is very important. But even communicating that this isn't this isn't a choice, but we need to figure out how to work, on, work through this together and figure out what changes we might do later down the road 
is um, the best you can do. But thank you for that comment. Yeah, and, and I just echo that as transparent as you can be is great. It's hard to do because it's hard to get a venue to get the information that people want out. I mean, if you go to a faculty meeting and say, hey, we're going to go through the whole methodology about how we came up with everyone's salary, most people are going to be pretty interested. When you go through the departmental finances, you're going to have half of them heads buried in their phones looking for something else like, I don't like math, I don't want to be here, that's your job, right? That's why we pay you to do that stuff. I want to go out and do something else. You know, I, mean, I got a lecture to give or something else. So having an a open and clear communication and um, a ways that you can push information out to the people that want it and that it feels transparent when they come and ask for information, you kind of open the full robe up, give them everything that they want, um, is exactly the ways you minimize some of that. But folks are usually coming when they're asking, when they've worked up the ask, there's going to be emotion tied to their response. And just being transparent, still, they're still going to feel like, well, I still want that $35,000 raise, right? And it doesn't matter that every assistant professor makes exactly the same as I do, I think They've convinced themselves enough for the ask, so figuring out what's driving their emotional trigger will help the conversation. Otherwise, you'll spend an hour and a half going through the math with them, and they'll still be frustrated. All right, next case. Uh, either the charge nurse comes to you and says, Dr. House, we've changed the name significantly because every time we've done this, it's actually been somebody who thought it was somebody else. In their, work, in their shop, so we just made it ridiculous at this point. So if there is a Dr. House in here, I'm really sorry. Um, but uh, keeps coming, uh, appearing like he's hungover, comes in a little bit late, starts out really slow, talks about how hard he partied the night before, maybe some of the nurses were even at the party. What do we do? And then the second one, um, a faculty member comes to you, and this is a huge leap, right, because a faculty member feels like perhaps that they are um, betraying or transgressing against some sort of social code and says, you know, I think one of my colleagues might have a problem. Approaches. Anyone had to deal with it? Yeah, Anybody yeah. have to deal with it more than five times? So, guys, it's out there. If you haven't dealt with it individually, um, you will very soon. And before we open the discussion, it highly, highly, highly behooves you to figure out what your, your, um, your institution's plan is for stuff like that and what needs to be disclosed and to whom and to how. And uh, I've got monstrous horror stories of not knowing those things myself and it's, it's embarrassing for everybody. Please, please, please dial it up and figure out what goes on at your institution. Sure. But let's talk about how do you react to these individuals. Let me, let me, let me yeah, sure. twist it a little further. So the scenario is you're, you're called. How many of you have been called while the faculty member is in the ED and someone says they're impaired? Okay. Someone, how'd you handle it? Or did you say not my problem and call someone else? You what? Yeah. yeah. Phone a friend. So uh, we, there was an administrator uh, in the department at the time. We had them go get the faculty member and the resident when it happened at the, for a different person uh, and quarantine them in a separate location. Um, the human resource staff physically comes to the emergency department and uh, offers them the voluntary option to disclose that they are impaired um, and, and go home. Uh, or to refuse that they are voluntarily impaired and then they are tested. Um, and if they're tested or they, if they're tested and they come back positive, they would be suspended and or fired if they refuse to disclose. And if they refuse to be tested, it's um, considered uh, an admission of guilt um, and they're summarily suspended. So a conversation is had with that person and they get to make a decision what they want to do. In both instances, um, well, in one instance, the person was actually impaired, in another, it was actually a different illness. Um, the person who was impaired admitted they were impaired, um, and they were removed and taken to uh, counseling and successfully completed a program. Um, but, you know, it's imperative that people actually tell you they're impaired. Um, you know, the alternative was we had a resident who was at work impaired, and no one told you until like this the following day where they were like, I was a little worried, and, you know, and then you go read the records, and it's like you could have put a toddler on the computer, and it could have looked similar to the, what was typed. Um, so, I mean, I think that it's important to... That's called to, epic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
I think it's important to remove them immediately and put them in a location where um, people are not aware what's going on. Unfortunately, one of ours was an after hours experience where they said, well, they need to be tested and that testing needs to happen in the only open location, which is the emergency department. Um, and we refused. Um, and our chair actually you know, negotiated that someone else would come in and take them and draw their blood elsewhere um, and, and get their samples done elsewhere um, and have them registered under a DOE name, et cetera. So, you know, I think that it's really important to have the ability to have the person have some protection in this instance. Um, and generally, from my understanding, is it's, it's a disclosure. Um, and if they don't disclose, then it's not disclosed. For the first instance, when this happened, um, we brought the person in and said, you know, we're very worried and we'd like for you to voluntarily go for um, a program that does screening. Uh, and would recommend to you based on your disclosure of your substance use, your alcohol use, and whatever you tell them in this protected, confidential um, experience, whether or not they would suggest any treatment or therapy for you. And in that instance, they recommended an outpatient program for this person, which they voluntarily went to and were very successful. Um, but in, in both instances, you know, I think it's making sure they understand that you're doing it for them um, and that it's, you know, not, um, it's not supposed to be penalty, which I feel like when you're saying get tested or get fired, it's sort of hard to have that, right? Um, and to really make sure that you're prefacing m repeatedly with this is, your, this is your livelihood, this is your life, and we want to help you, and you need to allow us to help you be helped. Um, and I think that when you can get people to understand that that is the case, um, you know, hopefully in the end you can have a successful outcome for, for your people. Sure. So, you know, one of the things I think you said focus on the end game, like, you know, this is incredibly unpleasant. I'm sorry that we're having to go through this. We need to do what we need to do based on whatever institution you have. And all the rules are different, different states, different institutions and otherwise. But on the other end of this is a better clinician, a better father, a better spouse, a better friend, and try to keep that focus on what is the end game for each of these uh, cases. So perfectly, right? I'm going to call you to deal with this in any of my shops. The, um, that's exactly the right way to do it. it I, I would underline, you need to understand what your local resources are. I fumbled this completely the first time I had it. Um, I was called about, the faculty had been working for about five hours, and a nurse called and said, there's just something going on. I think I smell alcohol. So it's two in the morning. I come in. I can't tell. I've got no sense of smell to begin with. <laughs> behavior looks normal to me. I tell him the concerns. He, absolutely not, absolutely not, absolutely not, absolutely not, absolutely not. So I sent him home. Rookie mistake, right? Um, young medical director, it was like my first year. He was older than I was, right? Um, huge mistake. But I have, over time, had people come with the, I think there was something going on yesterday. I just wasn't sure, so I didn't do anything about it. So I think it was super important to talk to your faculty, talk to them about the reality of impairment, talk about the risk our specialty carries with that, and that the need to have a confrontation if there's anything at the moment in time, because it's your best opportunity to help that individual, never mind to protect the department, protect the patients, everything else, but for their best interest is to be intervened upon in a way when you can confront them directly and say, you. You know, they've con confessed to you, they told her, they consented and said, yep, here it is, um, critical to do. One more comment and then we'll, we're going to go through two things quickly and then we've got to be done. I just have a question. So if you're saying that each of you have had over five mm -hmm. issues, did you have any pre-warning or every time it was a statement like this or were there things that you said in hindsight, oh yeah, I maybe should have thought of it? Um, so there, I've had a total of six, and just for of those six, five of them are now completely recovered and, and functioning clinicians and happy faculty members, and one still employed, just not with the institution where it occurred. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, and oftentimes, well, I will say with every situation, other people have come back and said, I noticed something. And sometimes it's very subtle, but people are perceptive, particularly emergency medicine. We're perceptive on behaviors, and we have to learn everything about a person within just a few minutes and their motivations. We see these things. We don't want to, but I think it's incumbent upon those individuals and also the safety of our patients 
um, to act on it. It's tough. It's, I've, I've, I've messed this up more times than I've gotten it right and learned with everyone. So. Can I just interject? So, so of the, of the most agonizing case I had of this for the faculty member was a complete shock. And that if I had lined up the 100 faculty and said, who's the least likely to have a substance use disorder problem, it would have been that individual. So I think you know, addiction is a powerful force, and, and people can get really good at hiding it. And, um, and uh, through, in this situation, it came through uh, actually an auto accident and then um, some other mm -hmm. issues that came up. But um, uh, so it's, it's uh, you, you will be tremendously surprised in, in, a, in a fairly good number of cases, I think. So, and, and I'll say the, I've not had as good outcomes. Um, I have two dead. Um, uh, one, when I was, both of them a long time ago, but both failed the efforts at recovery. Um, one of them died pretty quickly, the other one took about, took a little longer. Um, some of them were with the same person, where I got two or three like, hey, I think, maybe, you know, a year later, hey, I think, maybe, and finally worked through that process. Um, but it's out there, I mean, the alcohol one is the one that I think you pick up a little more. You hear about it more, you hear about the parties, you hear about stuff, you see it at meetings. Um, but the pills um, are harder to detect, and, and we're smart. We're really good at hiding this stuff. So we're mostly out of time, so we're going to bounce through. Yes? because it's very important to yep. follow your policy and procedure. Yep. If you have established policy and procedure yeah, that guides your medical staff, which you yep. do, you need to follow yep. it. You, you m absolutely, absolutely must know the ground rules of your institution. There are things that make perfect sense at one shop that will be completely impossible at another. If you're at a state institution, it's going to get even more complicated. Um, so we're out of time, so I'm going to blast through Oh, it's one of my favorites, right, turf. Um, but let's talk about one thing with turf. You will all have this. Um, I would, this is where I'd really recommend you talking specifically. If you want to talk about how you have the fight about anesthesia, about who gets to decide who gets admitted, understanding that's going to be emotional triggers for you and how you work through those problems. But unfortunately, we don't have time to go into them right now. Um, so. I think we're tiling things up here. Basically, the take-home point is that if you win the, you know, seeing this as a win-lose kind of game is a very faulty one. There isn't a, a villain and a victim, but trying to see the issue from the other person's point of view and then trying to address whatever those things are that made this a conflict to begin with. And realizing that giving a little or um, changing some of the ways you view things is not a uh, loss and it's not a compromise that makes you weak. It's a way that you get to uh, something called compromise and avoiding, um, avoiding conflict. And the, the underline in that is if you're, if you're, help, if you're cautious or consciously trying to understand what's driving their emotional response and their behavior, if you can figure that out, you will be more likely to be able to advocate for what your needs are and get your conversation through because you are you're going around the obstacle that you didn't know was in the room. Right, your favorite cartoon. Yes. <laughs> this so, is the one situation where somebody leaves happier than, yes. than before. Yes. So. <laughs> all right, so I think that's all the time we have. So thank right. you very much for the participation and your attention. Yes, Thanks thank so, you so much, everyone. So much. Hope you have a great thank conference. You. So.